Welcome back to our Ultrasound Case of the Month series. As always, email me with any questions or concerns at gzon at iu.edu. This patient was actually seen on my own without a resident, yet I have to give full credit to Dr. Weber, one of our third-year residents, who asked about the patient when he overheard me discussing her case with the admitting team. It was Dr. Weber who suggested utilizing ultrasound. The case starts with a six-year-old female presenting for evaluation after a mechanical fall. She fell onto her right side after missing a step and slid down four stairs. She was complaining of excruciating pain on her right lateral chest and presented by a medic since she could not ambulate secondary to her pain. Given her age, multiple medical comorbid conditions, and the severity of her pain, advanced imaging was obtained. Her CT showed five acute rib fractures without complicating hemo or pneumothorax. There is wide practice variation as it relates to rib fracture management. On reassessment, my initial pain medication interventions had not provided adequate pain relief. I decided to submit the patient for pulmonary toilet and pain medication given the presentation. At this point, Dr. Weber asked why I had not considered an ultrasound-guided nerve block. Sadly, I didn't have a great answer. With his prompt, I discussed the block with the patient who readily agreed. The two most common blocks utilized for rib fracture management in the emergency department setting are the erector spinae block and the serratus anterior block. While both blocks are incredibly simple, I'm going to discuss the serratus anterior block because most physicians have an easier time conceptually putting an anesthetic bolus in the lateral chest wall rather than next to the transverse process of the spine required for an erector spinae block. Here's a diagram from a recent ASEP Now article showing relevant anatomy of the serratus anterior plane block. The most important anatomy to appreciate is a lateral cutaneous nerve with its anterior and posterior branches because that area is where the local anesthetic is placed right on top of the serratus muscle. The serratus block was initially described in breast surgery patients yet was also found to be quite effective in patients with rib fractures. The block has been shown effective to decrease pain scores along with objective improvement in other measures like respiratory rate and incinimus spirometry volumes. When utilizing a long-acting local anesthetic, pain control tends to last 8 to 12 hours. When performing a serratus block, the cutaneous branches of nerves T2 through T9 are targeted. Before reviewing ultrasound anatomy, a review of surface anatomy is important. In these pictures, the latissimus dorsi is in yellow, the serratus muscle is in red, and the pectoralis is in green. For identification of anatomy, a high-frequency linear probe is positioned at the nipple line in a male or the inframammary fold in a female. Here's an ultrasound in the region depicted in the previous slide. Take a moment and attempt to identify the important structures for this block. While you may not have performed this block before, I am willing to bet many of you have performed an extended FAST examination which should help with anatomy appreciation. Here is a depiction of the relevant anatomy of the previous image. As you can tell, the serratus muscle sits right on top of the rib. Another important structure to highlight is the pleural line, the lung sliding that is visible. This exemplifies the importance of making sure your needle location is always known. Additionally, it shows why many suggest directing the needle tip toward the rib because it serves as a good safety backstop. The previous video shows the probe overlying the mid axillary line. The start of this view is a similar depiction, yet I slide slightly posterior with the probe to allow visualization of the latissimus to come into view. Once again, the anatomy is depicted in this picture. The latissimus dorsi is now seen superficial of the serratus muscle and is highlighted in yellow. Hopefully, these two examples allow clear appreciation of the simplicity of the relevant anatomy to safely perform this block. Identification of the rib would be my suggested first step. Identification of the other structures subsequently becomes much easier. The serratus anterior block is known as a plane block. As the name suggests, it is targeting a fascial plane and the nerves that live in that plane. In this block, those nerves are the lateral cutaneous nerves. The plane block allows anesthesia to the entire chest wall that would not be possible otherwise. Like all plane blocks, volume is your friend. Most sources recommend 30 milliliters of fluid for the block. Respiratory motion of the chest wall helps the anesthetic move to cover the entire chest wall. I included this picture of a nerve block setup. The 30cc syringe is hooked up to an IV extension tubing so another set of hands can push the anesthetic while you more easily have fine motor control of the needle in one hand and the probe in the other. This allows you to more easily direct the needle to the proper location and this setup a spinal needle is utilized. This is the actual video of our patient. Take a second to test yourself and attempt to identify the structures we highlighted in our previous examples. Hopefully you were able to correctly identify all the structures identified here, with the most important being the rib and serratus anterior muscle. The plane being targeted is the area just superficial of the serratus anterior muscle body. Now that we know our anatomy, this video shows the actual procedure. Thanks to Dr. Tom Ladaro who assisted in capturing the images. We can see the needle enter at the left of the screen, 
A small bolus of fluid is instilled to help clarify needle tip position. Additionally, this serves the function of a concept known as hydrodissection. The fluid is utilized to dissect the fascial plane, expanding the potential space on top of the serratus muscle in which we instill the anesthetic solution. The trajectory is towards the rib as previously discussed. Unlike last month's ultrasound guided IV case where I advocated for a short axis view of the needle, I advocate for a long axis approach for this block. This allows the entire needle to be visualized. As you can tell, a bolus of fluid starts to appear directly on top of the serratus muscle. Dr. Weber subsequently repositions his needle to farther fine-tune optimal placement. Once we are comfortable with our hydrodissection needle tip location, the remainder of the fluid was subsequently instilled, which unfortunately was not captured fully by this video. After allowing time for the local anesthetic to take effect, the patient reported rapid improvement in her pain. She was able to walk to the bathroom, which represented a stark improvement since she was unable to ambulate before the block. Additionally, her incentive spirometry volumes improved. The block allowed time for the multimodal approach to her pain to take effect and she was able to be discharged the next morning. While not stated, I recommend a long-acting local anesthetic. Ropivacaine and bupivacaine are the two most commonly described. Plane blocks require large volumes to work by allowing spread along the fascial plane. It is important to calculate maximum doses of any local anesthetic for the safety of our patients. Dilution with normal saline to achieve the desired volume without hitting a maximum dose of local anesthetic has been described. While local anesthetic toxicity is quite rare, these patients should at least be on a cardiac monitor. Additionally, an appreciation of the CNS and cardiac side effects is important. CNS signs of toxicity are perioral numbness, a metallic taste, muscle twitching, altered mental status, and seizures. These tend to precede cardiovascular effects with classic findings of sympathetic activation, with the most feared complication being ventricular arrhythmias. Supportive care and lipid rescue are the treatment for local anesthetic toxicity. Complications are rare and I feel these blocks are very safe, yet like any procedure, you should know the potential complications. I think pain adjuncts like ultrasound guided blocks can be incredibly useful in taking care of our patients. With that said, I don't utilize them regularly in my rib fracture patients. Yet in my practice, they work great in select patients who either don't obtain relief or don't tolerate traditional therapies. The prolonged relief of pain provided tends to allow other interventions and therapies to take effect and get the patient positively moving towards recovery. Thanks for watching and feel free to comment below.